first let me say I have no special knowledge of Thomas Edison. Um, I just have the interest and I had the time to do the research. Actually finding someone who's made a lifelong study of Edison, they're few and far uh, in between, so uh, you're stuck with me. But I will, I will claim no, no absolute knowledge. And I'll tell you, you could not find a more difficult subject to lecture on than Thomas Edison because everyone knows of him. Everyone has been taught in school. Everyone has seen a play. Everybody's watched a TV show. Everybody's read a book. And so you all have your ideas and your preconceived notions of things that are, t that are interesting to you, and you ignore the stuff that maybe is interesting to me. And so I've tried to cover a little bit of everything. Uh, if I haven't covered your favorite aspects, uh, like I, I, believe I personally, I completely blew off his family and kids in this lecture. I apologize to the family and kids. Um, if you want to know, we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, if I don't explain something or there's something on the slides that don't make sense, um, ask right away. But I'll leave time at the end, hopefully uh, a lot of time for you to, uh, to ask questions. And lastly, I want to admit that I went into this with some, some preconceived prejudices and biases. And that's me, and I'm not proud of it, but it is me. Anytime someone assigns a label of, of genius or best there ever was, I instinctively resist that. Um, and it has to, maybe the way I was brought up, maybe it was my career, whatever it is, but I had them and at least I know about them. So I tried to work, work through that. But bear that in mind, I went into this with a little bit of, of uh, skepticism. I tend to believe that you were in the right place at the right time you hired the right people and they did all the work and you took all the credit. Or, or maybe you were just lucky a couple times, you know? God shone down on you and you succeeded twice and everybody else said, oh, genius. So I did have that, that bias going in. Uh, so having said that, the, the first half of the 1800s were really kind of a magical time and you have to understand a bit about that. Uh, because it allowed this all to happen. There was quite a bit going on um, you know, in, in technology, both here in the US. And remember that communication was still slow. And so things were being developed in parallel, even if you were only a state or two apart. If you were a country apart, it could take months to synchronize information up. So there was a lot happening in Europe that was parallel being developed here in the US. And not just that, but university to university, science to science. There was a lot that was not uh, fast. And so there's been, you know, a hundred years of people analyzing who was first to develop this versus that. Isn't it true that it wasn't Edison, but it was really this person in Milan? So, um, you know, that's the, the time frame. So Thomas Edison, right, born in, in 1847, last of seven children. Uh, we're, we could literally spend a half an hour, I think, on childhood. Uh, what made him what he was? How did he get to that point? Um, he was self-taught by his mother, who was a school teacher. His brain was a little too active for the local school, and the teacher said he's too disruptive and um, mom got upset and pulled him out of school and said, I will educate you from here on out. Uh, but let's, let's just leave it by saying that he had a very, very agile mind. Uh, all the stories of family, friends, even from a very early age, persistently asking questions. Um, his early love was chemistry and having a chemistry set, um, as most every child uh, did at that time. Electricity wasn't something you taught, you know, you didn't buy computer kits for your kids back then. Chemistry sets were what you had, uh, especially if you lived out in the farm area where there tended to be lots of chemicals and explosives and stuff laying around. I'm not telling you personal stories, I'm just saying. Um, it is likely Thomas Edison had ADHD in some, somewhere in that spectrum. Um, constantly hopping ideas back forth, um, always jumping from something. Uh, but he had such a powerful mind, even though he kept hopping from topic to topic, he was able to finish the topics in that short period of time. So he was able to work on many, many things at once. 
Um, there's no way to prove that. There are people that use Thomas Edison as the perfect example why you don't treat ADHD uh, with, with chemicals today because heck, we'll all turn out like him. Um, it's, it's nice. Uh, his career really started uh, when he was working on a, new, on a train. He was uh, a newsie selling newspapers, candies, and the like. Uh, the story goes, and no one seems to question it, that he saved the son of a telegrapher from a, a moving box car. The little kid walked in front of it. Edison yanked him out of the way. And as in gratitude, the father taught him not just how to, to operate a teller, but got him a job doing telegraphy. And you have to remember, at that time, telegraphy was cutting edge of electricity. It was the batteries, it was the wires, it was the cables, it was the, the electromagnets, um, the losses that you incurred going down the line. It was everything to do with electronics at the time. And so he had such an inquisitive mind, even from the very beginning, it wasn't just operating the key, he was trying to improve and tinker going forward. Uh, he left home at 16 uh, to be a traveling telegrapher. There were a lot of, because of uh, the Civil War, uh, took up a lot of the telegraphy uh, experts. And so he was able to fill in moving around the country. Uh, where does this slide end? Yeah, so he, he quickly he got past that and decided, I really do want to invent. Um, no one, he doesn't even really attribute why. He just knew he always wanted to do that. Um, he created a, a stock ticker company for himself, but he also improved one of the main machines at the time and was able to, uh, to sell that to a leading stock company. Let me go on the next slide. Yeah, so he made, made this, this nice improvement, $40,000 at the time you know, was, was a massive amount of money for someone that's, that's 21 years old. And rather than, than buy a house, buy a car, what he did was he bought a lab. Thomas Edison already knew that he had so many ideas, he couldn't possibly do them all themselves. And this was very unusual. Other inventors at the time would have an idea for a product, they would make a model, they'd tinker with it, they'd play with it, and it would be this, this time lag before it got done. Edison had too many ideas. So he hired four machinists and electricians, and he would throw ideas at them. And so he was using his money right away to start being uh, a designer. And so this small lab was in New York. He would do contract work for the stock ticker companies, the telegraphy companies, improving what they had uh, on contract, and then feeding the money back into his, his little small lab. Uh, so he already has uh, a group of people. He's getting very well known in a small area. So in the people that do telegraphy machines and the stock ticker companies in New York, he's already electric light bulb company. Uh, you know, across the board newspapers, Edison will solve light bulb problem immediately. Gas, natural gas prices, plummet. Uh, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> and, and he knew that. It, it, it came to figure that out. You really had to solve three key problems with a light bulb. Um, everybody knew that you needed a, a glowing filament inside, and it had to be in a vacuum. And that wasn't something Edison came up with. Everybody was doing it. In fact, Edison bought the rights to someone else's patent of a vacuum enclosed light bulb. Uh, the problem was how to make a really powerful vacuum inside, how to form the glass, how to keep the vacuum in. Um, what is the best material inside? He spent an entire year playing with metallic filaments inside, platinum, rubidium, copper, tin, um, and then finally went back to what he started with, which was the carbonized filaments. Uh, for the electric electrical people out there, carbon has a higher resistance, which means you can control better how much it heats, whereas the metal, it goes from, I'm getting hot, I'm red hot, I'm burning up uh, too fast. Uh, and then it's not just that, but you have to be able to make these replaceable in the house. And the bigger problem also were 
the metal filaments going in to talk to this uh, carbon filament. Every time the light bulb heats up and cools down, heats up, cools down, that expansion and contraction would crack the base. And so the light bulbs that were running for 12 hours, 14 hours initially, they would only run for two or three cycles of powering it on and off. So that was a problem to be solved. But, but of course, Edison, um, he has what no, other, no one else has working on this. He has staff. And his staff, he can put many people working on many things, and he can look at the results, and he can steer the direction. The other inventors were trying things themselves sequentially. And so that was a huge advantage uh, to him. Uh, and his investors were getting a little nervous. Uh, people were accusing him of playing games with the natural gas market for profit. Uh, but really, he was getting all his ducks in a row. He had ideas. He had to get the patents in place. And Edison wanted more than just a light bulb. He realized that the light bulb isn't what he wants to sell. He wants to sell the entire story. He wants to deliver electricity and light to you. And so he has to solve uh, the power issues, uh, the power grid, um, the, the bulb replacement in the house. And much more important was how to profit off of this. I need to bill each and every one of you that are consuming my electricity. And it's funny because he doesn't care about the money. He's not wealthy uh, for wealth's sake. He wants the wealth so he can continue to develop. Right? And that's pretty important. There's a lot of people that keep acquiring wealth so that they can have the bigger house, the bigger car, um, buy the bigger island. He really will put it all back in without changing his lifestyle at all. He's still wearing grubby clothes. Um, and only because of his wife does he actually have a nice house so that he can entertain some. But she has to force him to dress up uh, to, to entertain. Um, so uh, he does get it done. Uh, success. Uh, New Year's Eve, 1879, he says, I'll finally show you. Special trains run everyone out to the Menlo Park Labs. It's, it's brilliantly lit up uh, with hundreds of light bulbs running off of his own, uh, his own power. Uh, and, of course, now he, he has to fulfill the second half, which is delivering the power. So he takes, pretty much shuts down the Menlo Park Labs, uh, takes all of his top people, moves them to New York, and begins to build the Pearl Street Station. Uh, Pearl Street is six steam engines, each one driving a, a custom DC direct current uh, dynamo that he made. For some reason, Edison has decided that 110 volts DC is the correct voltage to use. No one's ever justified why that is. 100 works just fine, thank you. Uh, but no, 110. So six dynamos, each one 100 kilowatts, each one capable of driving 1,200 light bulbs um, the, um, you know, I'll show you per where Pearl Street is uh, in a second. Um, but also, Edison has to appease his investors. He has to keep money flowing in because he shut down his development labs and no more contracts are happening. So he actually starts installing small power plants into his investors' homes uh, and rich people's homes. And that keeps them off his back long enough uh, to solve the problem. As you see, you know, Edison controls this tremendous commodity, but to get it done, he has to be a politician. He has to be a businessman. He has to be a master negotiator. He has to work through downtown Manhattan and convince them to dig up the streets and that he can lay the power. Um, so all of, all of that has to happen. Um, I'm going to take a, a short aside because I don't really know where else to put it. It was at this time of developing the light bulb that Thomas Edison made his only, single, only scientific invention, right? Everything else he did was a product, was an improvement, but he had one scientific invention. And it was basically called the Edison effect. When he started out, you probably can't see this very well, but come look afterwards, his light bulbs were, were crystal clear, okay? After you ran them for a while, they would get cloudy, they would get dark. 
and he didn't know what it was. He figured that the carbon was coming off of the, the elements inside and was being radiated out to the walls, the inside glass of his, of his light bulbs. He'd break open a light bulb and you could actually scrape the carbon off the inside of the glass. He didn't know what it was, but he did run experiments. He put a, had a light bulb with not just the two wires, but ran a third wire in the middle. And he could prove, he could control this emission of carbon. And he knew it had a polarity. He could shunt it from one side to the other. So he called it the Edison effect. He filed a patent on it. And then he dropped it for reasons unknown. This is what became known as an electron tube, which led to the revolution of radio. Okay, but it started here. So it's interesting, though, that is the, the only thing ever considered to be pure science from Thomas Edison. Um, so current wars, how long do you want to spend? A day, a week, five minutes? A lot of this was, was fairly overblown. Everybody gets focused on the, ex the electrocution of elephants, putting in the, the electric chair, um, as if it were Thomas Edison out there hooking clamps onto the, the elephant's feet. Um, he had staff, and staff were also the, the PR people, the people, the salesmen that were trying to get this done. You know, Edison Electric has, you know, brought Pearl Street live. They're lit up a part of, of Manhattan, and he's installing uh, 120 or so power plants across the country. But meanwhile, Westinghouse... Thompson Houston, Brush Electric, all of these are players on the AC side of the world. And they're installing city by city also. And in fact, in uh, one year, the AC power plants, they put in 68 plants in one year to Edison's 20. And so um, the current war is going on, but uh, a lot of people think it was a, a lot of hype, and then the Senate or the Congress voted AC, DC, all in favor. Uh, it didn't happen that way. It was a very slow grinding war, if you will. Uh, here's part of the problem. Here's Pearl Street in Manhattan. It's a tiny piece. And that's all that his massive power plant with its six steam engine and six massive turbos, that's all it could power. And so if you wanted to power Manhattan, you would need dozens of these, and that is just Manhattan. Um, there's a, we built a, a small demo in the main uh, museum. If you want to see the problem, it's, it's nicely uh, illuminated. <laughs> that was funny. Thank you. Uh, the problem is with, with DC, or with, with really with anything, as, as power goes down the line and you each building steals a little bit of power, the voltage goes down. And uh, Edison's one mile radius from his power plant, at the edge of that, he was already down 70% in voltage. So my light bulbs at the end are 70% less bright than the ones in the middle. And so that's a problem. Um, there's a, there's a, a second problem that really gets ignored as well. And that's a lot of this is being done by industry. The, the people that are running massive motors uh, and, and they need elevators and they're driving their sewing machine plants, they need their own voltages. You might need 400 volts DC for uh, a huge machine engine, whereas you want 50 volts DC to run the elevator up and down the new skyscrapers. And so a AC power plant can generate essentially unlimited voltages. What do you want? I'll do it. Transformers convert any voltage of AC to any other voltage. And so as you go to his 70% his level, an AC power plant just says, fine, I'll just put in a transformer and kick it back up. Right? On every power pole within every two or three blocks, you'll see a transformer up on a power line stepping the voltage back up. As it drops a little bit, we step it back up. You come to me and say, I would like 50 volts for my, uh, my uh, elevator. Easy for me to do. 
couple connections on my transformer, done. Edison has to put in an entire new dynamo. So from a cost point of view, it's very, very clear uh, who was going to win this battle. And, and it was happening. Uh, it was apparent that AC was winning. It was apparent to everyone except uh, Thomas Edison. His investors can see it. His expert co-workers can see this. They all beg for him to change and start doing AC. Uh, and he doesn't. Um, well, speculation as to why. Pride. Um, he was worried about safety. AC you tend to send out at 480 volts and step it down as you get farther away from the power plant. He liked to send out that 110 volts and then build more and more power plants. Uh, you can get a lot uh, more painful shock from 480 volts than you can from 100 volts. And that's maybe why he was worried. The most likely one, and it's not, not very polite to, to poor Thomas, um, they said, frankly, he couldn't understand the mathematics of AC. Um, Edison was brilliant. There's no doubt about that. Very agile mind. But mathematics was not a strong point for him. And the math of uh, voltage going up and down and, and magnetic fields growing and collapsing and going the other way and then recollapsing, the losses, um, very specialized mathematics to do this. Uh, and, and Edison didn't get it. And so he had people that got it, but he couldn't direct them to build better AC motors. He couldn't provide any value add. And so a lot of people think that's why he essentially just abandoned that market. Um, eventually, it's unfortunate, um, his investors essentially kicked him out of Edison Electric and said, you know, you're on the board. We've promoted you to the board, but you're no longer running day-to-day -day operations. They gave him a lot of stock, um, but he was out. Uh, and then... You know, all the things you see from, from GE that are out there are all without him at the helm. Uh, it is, it's to me fascinating that DC didn't just end, it kept running. Um, in fact, you know, literally a few years ago, San Francisco finally shut down their DC grid. They had power lines running AC and right next to them they had power lines running DC all through downtown. Those were used again by the elevators in the early stuff. Um, so finally, was it died sort of a, a, a slow death. Um, so. They do. There is, in fact, the, there's one right near us. There is a huge power plant in um, East Bay, Oakland, somewhere, and they feed power into San Francisco. San Francisco is a very power-hungry city, and they need all the power they can get. One of the problems, you have to go under the bay. DC, uh, my engineer friends, DC under the bay, um, there's no changing magnetic field, so you have no losses. If you run AC under the bay, that magnetic field, basically the water surrounding the cables, suck all your power out. So over there, they create all this AC power, convert it to DC, ship over 1,200 or 2,400 volts DC, in a massive fat cable, and then convert it all back to AC. You can get away with that today. Today's technology is great. You know, if we had today's technology back then, DC probably would have won. But you know, it, only within the last 10 years did we have the ability to uh, to pull that off. So it was all it was all current war, right? For 10 years, Edison was fighting this battle and doing all this, right? No. I mean, he is constantly doing other things. Um, the West Orange Labs, much bigger, much more powerful than, than he had in Menlo Park. West Orange, 60,000 square feet with the best libraries the world had ever seen on, on current technologies. Chemistry labs, uh, massive machinery factories, and, and then lots of empty buildings to expand into. Uh, so Edison's pouring all of his money, again, not into his own personal wealth, but into being able to invent. Um, 
at some point in time, it was later on, where's my list of how many people he had working there? Uh, thousands of people. Somewhere it says this. Trust me, it says that somewhere. Um, so during those 10 years, uh, one of the things that happened that really annoyed Thomas Edison is that Alexander Graham Bell went from his uh, telephones and made a better phonograph. Edison knew he had to do better than his little foil cylinder, but oh my god, someone did it. And suddenly his product was being improved on, and he couldn't stand that. And so he quickly made a, a series of major steps to make viable wax cylinder recorders. Edison believed these were really for business uh, initially, that bosses would use them to record memos. Uh, people would actually use them for early answering machines for their telephones. They could actually record on their wax cylinders. So there's several patents on, on that. Um, but he figures it out, and he creates uh, pre-recorded music cylinders. Again, the initial ones, the little ones with the horns on top, different media, different speeds to play, the wax cylinders, the later ones, blue cylinders. Um, if you ever see one, you can tell the early black cylinders, uh, Edison gold records, early stuff, Edison Amberola records, the blue recording discs. Those are the later ones. Uh, the other thing, it's, it's interesting, uh, Edison has decided the best technology for recording onto this is called Hill and Dale recording. So the actual scribing into the wax is up and down movements of the needle. And as it goes around, it carves deeper or shallower, whereas the other record players were moving the needle side to side. And of course, that's what we're used to today. But if you tried to play an early Edison uh, flat record on a modern record player, nothing. Just destroy it. So he was convinced that was best, and he was right. It was better sounding, but he had a small marketing problem. He believed that he knew what you should be listening to. And so he was controlling uh, the catalog of music that was available on Edison phonographs and Edison record players. And, and that newfangled jazz stuff? No, 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 no. We don't like that for Thomas Edison. And so a lot of people were looking at the, the discography, the stuff that was available to listen to, and they switched over to RCA Victor, um, you know, the, the Motorola, other, anything other than Edison. And eventually Edison had to exit the, uh, the music market. What have I missed? Railroad engines. Um, and then we'll go into more detail. Of, of a couple of these, right? But, but the moving pictures uh, happened during the current war. And so while Edison's worried about everything else, about, about motors and, and current distribution and power and winning this battle, he's still thinking and still moving on to, to new ideas. So in, in 1888, um, Edward Muybridge, who did the Zupraxiscope, right, that's the round disc that if you spin it, you see the little figures hopping around the edge. Um, he approaches Edison and says, will you please mate one of your, your music players to my big spinning disc of pictures? Because that will be really neat is we can listen while we watch. And Edison goes, yeah, I think I've got another idea. How about I do a much better solution? So he immediately files a patent disclosure and says, I believe that I can do for the eyes, what the phonograph does for the ears. I can record and play back motion pictures. And so he, he starts that. It's interesting that the actual credit for motion pictures, according to all the experts, goes to, uh, to Dixon. And Dixon was, worked very, very close with Edison. They both would come up with ideas. They would both toss them. Who actually went? from a cylinder of pictures to a celluloid strip of pictures. Who knows? The notes actually say that Edison directed Dixon to build a machine with the celluloid strips. Edison was going on a trip to Europe, um, half vacation, half business. And when he got back, Dixon showed him the working kinetoscope. And so who developed it? Who had the ideas? Um, probably joint. Kinetoscope, 
was a, essentially a small peep show machine. Turn the crank, 20 seconds of film loop goes past your eyes. Uh, Edison tried to link that to his own wax cylinder player uh, called a Kineta phone, and it didn't work. So, um, and, and as we go into this, it, it is interesting. This is one of the things that makes Edison so very, very difficult. You can't put him into blocks of time. You can't say there was a phonograph time, then there was a light bulb time, then there was a motion picture time. It doesn't work that way. They're so overlapped, and we'll show a timeline later on. And if you just look at all the things he was doing, it's almost inconceivable how he could keep juggling all of these ideas and, and keep them going. So the motion picture business, um, he does file patents on how to make a camera the, to actually shoot the film. The film technology is not there yet, um, but essentially it's stop and go. Advance the film, shoot a frame, let it develop. Advance the film, shoot a frame, let it develop. So stop and go, but he's got the idea. All it now takes is better film to get it done. And he, he forms a motion picture company. Remember that, that Edison isn't about making an object and leaving it out there. He wants to create a business, and the business means selling it to the public. So he creates the full motion picture business, 1,200 films and all. <coughs> but again, um, only lasts a, a little bit of time. The industry really moves on with people focused on it, and whether Edison just lost focus, lost containment, there was a fire that burned down his, his motion picture factory, but it was on its decline by then in any event. And then this is is fascinating, if you will, because Edison has always developed essentially pure technologies, mechanical things, things that move, things that have electricity. And suddenly he gets involved in the Ogden mines. And the, the Ogden mines is something to address a problem that he'd seen with iron ore. High-grade iron ore was being tapped out in the United States, and we were running out of iron. Edison was working on ideas with the railroads, and automobile at the time, and he realized the need for steel, and the U.S. didn't have it. But he had this idea of using electric magnets to separate out iron ore from low-grade ore. So he, he builds massive machines to crush rock and conveyor belts to move it, um, dust-free ways of lubricating uh, gearing, uh, all of these things that are on a massive scale as opposed to these small consumer products that he's been doing. And, and the other thing, other people think that this, and I've read books that, that said this was his midlife crisis because he left West Orange, New York. He left the society dinners and he went and lived out here in the mines. <clears throat> he worked on his designs as well as actually getting dirty, crawling under machines and fixing engines. So is this midlife crisis? I don't think so because he's still in constant communication. He's still generating 30 patents a year on stock tickers and phone improvements and phonograph improvements. And so just because he's out there building big toys doesn't mean he's, he's um, upset. Right? There, there's the second train of thought that says, hey, GE took away your company from you, and in rebellion you went out and sulked in the mines. Uh, I don't think that's, that's the case, but again, that's, that's my personal opinion. But it is, it is interesting. He's out there by himself. He doesn't get bothered. He can actually get work done. He doesn't have reporters camped around. Uh, unfortunately, you know, as with what happens these days is you have a great idea and you're working on something and someone else goes, oh, look, there's all the iron ore you need in, you know, Pennsylvania. You don't need this low-grade stuff anymore. And the company goes out of business. It just, you know, blink of an eye, as soon as they announced the new stuff, he wasn't, wasn't necessary. But what he'd been doing was taking the excess crushed rock and selling it to the cement companies. Um, it makes some money. Well, he realized that cement companies were still using ancient technology, mostly developed in, in Europe, for how to toast the, the lime and mix the concrete. And frankly, what was being done in the US was, 
was fairly poor quality. So he enters the concrete business. Uh, he creates, again, more machines, rotating kilns to do higher grade work. Uh, and the market really never materialized for this better quality concrete. So he says, I'll make my own market. And he decides to build concrete houses. The concept was you build a mold, giant mold, and then you pour concrete on the top and it flows around and you're left with a house. And you move it to next door and you build another one. And so you can just plop houses down one by one. It'll be the greatest thing. It'll use all my concrete, and it'll be fantastic. And it solves various problems. Remember, he's got staff. He's got large amounts of employees that he's trying to get houses for. Um, he sees it as a win in a lot of different ways. Um, the molds don't work real well. Um, there's a couple pictures of his concrete houses. But this was a significant part of his later years was spent focused on concrete and concrete houses, not ignoring anything else, right? But he did spend a lot of time doing this. Uh, fancy houses and row houses, um, my personal vested interest in concrete houses flows through here. He does um, the Portland Cement Company, which is Edison's concrete business. Their, their claim to fame is they did pour Yankee Stadium uh, in a very short period of time. It's fabulous uh, work. But depression, uh, all the business went away. They shut that down. He came as close as possible to losing all his money in these ventures. Um, he sold his GE stock for the Ogden mines and the concrete business, and the profits never materialized. He still has revenue stream from his patents, uh, but, but the massive uh, wealth sort of went away. So just the same way that I skipped on his, his youth, we're going to skip a lot on the, the later years. He's, he's getting old. Uh, his number of patents, instead of 60 a year, or maybe down to only 20 patents a year. Um, he does a huge investment in, in batteries. He uses something called nickel uh, iron, N-I, nickel, F-E is iron, knife, N-I-F-E batteries, knife batteries were used in locomotives, World War II submarines, and are still used today as backup power for solar plants. They're extremely robust. They take um, charging well. You can short them out. You can overcharge them without them failing. So as far as a rechargeable battery goes, it's one of the better ones out there. It just doesn't quite have the energy density that people wanted, but still today. Um, he, he starts the flat record. Uh, business. Uh, again, that's followed on from his music business out of the discs, uh, or sorry, out of the wax cylinders. Uh, again, doesn't, doesn't make it. Uh, his health starts failing in the 1920s. He has uh, diabetes. He's got a variety of problems. He's, he's probably pushing himself a little too hard. So he starts to take these car caravans, and it, it seems like a small thing. He only took three or four of these. He's become friends with Henry Ford, um, Henry Firestone, the tire guy, and um, John Burroughs is a, uh, a naturalist. And they've decided they love going out on these roads that have never seen cars before with all these Model Ts from, from Ford. And it's a little caravan and being trailed by 50 reporters as they go. But it sort of again catches the country, uh, you know, reaffirms how great the, the down-home Edison really is. Uh, it's not really camping because they erect huge tents and have chefs and all, but, but it, 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 is, it was an important thing at the time. They were known as the vagabonds, and uh, papers constantly would tell you where they were and what they were doing day by day as they would go on these. Henry Ford on the left, then Edison, Burroughs, and uh, Henry Firestone. Harvey, Harvey, did I say Henry? How many times did I say that? It's Harvey, yes. I'll tell you my story about this, though. Um, I thought it was funny. It may be true, even. Um, uh, Firestone wasn't, I'm not going to say Harvey anymore. Firestone wasn't there on that trip, so it was just the first three. And they were out somewhere, and one of the cars broke down. And they couldn't get it fixed. I mean, you, you've got Ford and Edison, and they can't get the car fixed. So they take it to the local... Uh, you know, garage, and they wheel this thing in. And the mechanic looks at them and says, great, you know, um, 
I, I think it's probably the electrical system. And Henry Ford goes, or sorry, Thomas Edison goes, I am Thomas Edison. I assure you it is not the electrical problem. And so he goes, it's probably the fuel? Henry Ford goes, I am Henry Ford. It is not the fuel system. And so the mechanic looks over at, at Burroughs and goes, and you're Santa Claus, right? <laughs> it's written up. Maybe it's true. All right, so, so we're at the, the unfortunate end of, of Thomas's life. He's, um, you know, he dies peacefully. He was in a coma for a few days, comes out of his coma, allegedly says uh, to his wife, um, it's beautiful over on the other side, and then passes away. Um, he whispered it only to his wife, so his wife could have you know, embellished that, but uh, still makes a good story. And uh, uh, there were everybody that was close would come to the, the day of mourning, uh, but it was more significant that across the world, on one particular day, on the day that he was actually laid to rest, that every power plant dimmed their power, so all the lights would drop uh, for one hour as he was laid to rest. What's that? Where did he die? His house, which I don't know where it is. <laughs> um, he's he's laid to rest next to, uh, you know, on the property that he bought for. No, no, he bought a, a nice house for his second wife and the kids with his second wife. Um, she was much better at handling his fame than the first wife. She died early uh, complications of childbirth. The later analysis uh, actually says she died of a morphine overdose as they were trying to deal with her, her pain and depression. But the second wife was able to handle the world better and she would force him to... Uh, to actually take lunch breaks and would bring, you know, clothes for him to wear for the interview because he would just forget about it and work through, through whatever was supposed to happen. So uh, his wife was, was truly good in that aspect. He did, yes. His second wife, he tapped on her arm at a boring dinner, Will You Marry Me in Morse Code. And she tapped back, yes. <laughs> so a keeper, if you can do that. So interesting just to show the timelines of, of what all was happening um, at the same time. Uh, and then again, remember that each and every year, 60, 70, 80 patents a year, sometimes only 30. Uh, in the early concrete era, there was maybe only 10 patents uh, a year for a while. It took a, took a break, and then towards the end, they started tailing off four, five, six patents. Right before he died, he was fascinated with making natural rubber and finding local sources of making rubber from plants in the United States. Sure. It's, <laughs> hey, there's a lot. He's Thomas Edison. Um, wow. Oh, I brought this. Thank you. Gosh, I almost would never use this. Um, Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so small New York lab, 1870s, the Menlo Park lab era through the 80s, and then West Orange all the way out here, starting with 30 associates and then going up to 3,000. Um, for the phonograph right here in 1877, light bulb in 79, Pearl Street Live in 82, and here's your current wars. But while that's happening, he forms his mining company. The wax phonograph, pre-recorded cylinders are all going on. Motion picture happening at the same time. Now he's moved on to the actual mining of the ore, but he's got his, the National Phonograph Company making pre-recorded music, mass-produced cylinders, flat records, the nickel uh, iron batteries, the motion picture studios all going towards the end. Uh, a lot predating back in here, his early fame, the public adoration with uh, phonograph, motion pictures, just it seemed everything was coming out uh, of Edison. And then 
it kind of almost dropped off when it became the, the iron ore and the concrete. That was, didn't capture the, the, the eye of the public as much. Just a list of, of the variety of things that he had patents in, which is just another really interesting thing to think about with him. Uh, you know, other great minds like, like Tesla would focus in a particular area and, and pretty much stayed in offshoots of that area. Um, other great inventors, you know, Westinghouse himself was a fantastic inventor, but all dealing with, with railroads and railroad properties. Henry Ford and his patents on the automobile, all dealing with, with automobile. And here you've got, got Edison, and it's all over the map. You know, we didn't put a list of how many patents in each one. 1,073 patents in the United States alone. Uh, and then, of course, all the European uh, patents that covered those. Um, it's, it's fairly impressive. In my opinion, what were his greatest contributions? A lot of people say light bulb, electric grid, phonograph, motion pictures. I discount all of that. To me, he did two things that were, were just fantastic. Um, showing what a research lab can do. And, and that, of course, is carried on into what universities have today. Uh, IBM had a magnificent research lab where people were hired and paid just to think of new ideas. No task, no assigned uh, deadlines, just think of good things. So if you could become an IBM fellow, that got you to that level. Um, and then making invention something that everyone wanted to do, right? Because if, if you had an idea on how to make a better pair of pliers when you were working on the farm, you didn't just build a pair and then use it yourself. You had an idea to get that out to the world. And that was, again, something that I consider uh, extremely important. So the, the final slide, thank you. Uh, is he a genius? Right? Started with my doubts, and I think it's, it's extremely clear. Edison said he was not. Edison just said he worked really hard, and he just never gave up, and he took every failure as just another step in learning. Uh, he hired the best of the best to work in his factories. And admittedly, a lot of them were the ones that built some of the, the necessary pieces for his great invention. But they were the ones that were calling him the genius. They're the ones that dealt with him every day. And he's the one that, when they were in meetings, would come up with the new ideas that they didn't have themselves. And if you're the best there is, and there's someone else that's always a step ahead of you, right, and they're the ones that are calling you a genius, I'm not arguing. All right. So I think that's it. That's what I have. So I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. I may not know the answers to them, but I'm happy to, to try to answer them if you'd like. Yeah. Give me a personal opinion on Edison or Da Vinci and Ellen Musk. Wow. <laughs> I, so I, to, me, to me, Da Vinci is, oh, put me on the spot with Da Vinci. Um, I, I love the, the uh, Renaissance man, right? It's, it's the paintings, it's the sketches, it's the ideas. Uh, I think it's pretty tough to, to overlap them because the technology was so different back then. There were very limited things that Da Vinci could play with at the time. Uh, you know, you can design flying machines, but you're still left with, with fanciful things you can't really try out a whole lot. He couldn't bring them to market the way that Edison could in the time that Edison had. Um, so if I were ranking them, I'd go Edison, Da Vinci, Musk. No, I mean, compare Musk in, in, in view of those two. Oh, see now, see, now you're going to put... You I'm put, sorry, I didn't order right. No, that's fine. I know, I was just going to try to blow off Elon Musk because people throw the genius tag, the best there is tag at him. And that is what my initial reaction is. Oh, I don't think so. Um, you could have thrown Steve Jobs in there too. I could actually, I could answer Steve Jobs for you better. Um, no, I've never met uh, Elon Musk. He's got some great ideas. I think he um, shoots too far in the future 
uh, without something that can actually be deliverable or proven. And so uh, even things like, like Hyperloop, uh, you can build prototypes, but actually building that to a working viable transportation system, it, it's, it's a magnificent, it's too much work to get from A to B. So I'm not sure that I, I you know, a, a dreamer versus an, in, an inventor. To me, that, that's to my problem with Musk. But again, I've never met him. I haven't dealt with that field. You know, I've, with, I've been out of the high-tech field. Point out that Elon Musk has never invented anything. He is yeah. a dreamer. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the problem. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's Edison, right? It, Edison batteries were in electric cars at the time. Uh, he didn't invent it, but the, the DC motors, you know, throw it on a, a tricycle and off it goes. There's a, a fantastic uh, electric car at the Hiller uh, Airspace Museum. If you want to see one of the very early electric cars, it's, it's magnificent there. Yes, sir? Can you give us an idea of what uh, the museum has in addition to what's here in terms of Edison? Ah, so Edison is a problem, and we found this out when we put this exhibit together. Um, again, kudos to Allison and Logan who did uh, the research and, and went through our archives of you know, thousands of, of things to find. It's very easy to find things from the Edison Electric Company, from GE. Uh, it's tough to attribute them to Edison, right? So Edison sets up a lab, and he says, we need to build, uh, as electricity gets out there, uh, the first thing that everyone bought when electricity came to your house after the light bulb was a toaster. So you had to have a toaster. Well, well Edison Electric made hundreds of toasters of different, different styles and designs. How many did Edison actually work on himself? Nobody knows. He didn't patent any of them. Uh, I'm sure he was involved in meetings. So a lot of the artifacts we have are unfortunately Edison, you know, design, Edison company, but not actually Edison. And Westinghouse are kind of the same things. Westinghouse designed appliances. Westinghouse was, was the Uber president, but is he the one that's actually saying, go build a waffle maker? Uh, so a lot of the things we have on display are of the era. They're of the companies from Edison and, and Westinghouse, but they're not actually his design. We do have uh, the wax cylinder players. We have flat phonograph records that uh, plays beautifully. Um, we have one of the nickel uh, iron batteries in there. Some light bulbs, obviously. Um, good, good question, though. We, if you're saying if you came to the warehouse, would you see a plethora of, of Edison stuff? No, no, we don't. Uh, yeah. Most of the, the best of the best we have is, on, is sitting in the Williams house right now. Uh, there are more uh, big wax cylinder players, large freestanding wax players, and flat record players. We probably have 50 or 60 Edison records, the really, really fat. I was going to bring one and forgot. Uh, the, they're a shellac over uh, like wood pulp uh, records. We have... Um, yeah, not, not much else that's as far as big items go or even small items. So, again, it's tough. The really valuable stuff, the stuff that actually can be attributed to Edison himself, um, of course, those are all sitting in, in the West Orange labs, right? Anything. The, one of the, bat or the light bulbs that actually has the thermionic emission electrode added inside, there's only a few of those left in the world. You know, I'd, I'd love just to see one someday. You know, much less own one. So. Yes. Yeah. So at the, at the the Edison Ford Ford, who became really good friends with with uh, Edison, he really took that on himself to preserve Edison's legacy. And so when when Edison died, Ford didn't live too many more years after that. But he really set up um, the the archival of of the papers. Uh, most of the, everything Edison ever wrote is in the Rutgers Library. And in fact, 
you know, to do research on this, I really approached it three different ways. I read a couple books from different authors that are contemporary looks at Edison. I read two books that were on Edison written in the day of Thomas Edison. And if you're writing about someone who's still alive, I figured you'd better get it right because he might come and talk to you. Whereas the legends can grow and evolve over time and books today may have a different view. But then the other is, is these collection of papers in the Rutgers Library. You know, how many uh, thousand pieces of bamboo were ordered for filaments in the bulbs? How many people was he paying on payroll? Um, the letters he wrote to, uh, to various other inventors. Uh, Rutgers is, is a phenomenal archive of what there is. And then, of course, the Henry Ford Museum uh, really honors uh, Edison quite well. You're absolutely right. Yes, sir. There is also a property that Edison and Ford shared in Fort Myers, uh, Florida. I don't know if you've been there, but no. it's got a small laboratory, and that was where he experimented with marigold flowers to see if their sap would make rubber when we couldn't import rubber due to war. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get half of this story. There was something to do with that property where, where they'd bought in and neighbors had bought in and there became a, a property squabble between them of, of um, boundaries and, and I don't know how it came out, but uh, there was a, a paper written where Edison was, was quite upset with that, the way that property turned out. So it, it's something to do with the neighbors, but I don't remember any more of that. But yeah, I did, I did hear about it. And of course, then the rubber really never went, went anywhere. I do not. Um, you can find it online. Um, there are several, there were some interviews that were done um, as he, the 60th, no, 50th, 50th anniversary of the light bulb. Um, he went over to England and there was a massive uh, celebration for him. And there's some recordings of, of him being interviewed. And he's really still quite funny. He's, he's almost 80 years old now. Um, and they asked, what do you think about uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And Edison goes, oh, I, I don't think about it too much. I, I don't understand it. I, um, which I think, you know, 99% of the population has the same answer. So, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so there were really three periods of time that he actually stepped the technology forward. These are the last two, and of course the early, um, the tin four ones. The tin four ones, he didn't produce very many of them. Uh, these, you know, I, I couldn't put a number on it, but they're, they're quite available. If you wanted one, you could track one down. There's a couple projects going on where they're trying to make sure that every wax cylinder has been uh, recorded for posterity. Uh, UC Santa Barbara has a, a very large archive. We're supposed to go through our collection. Our museum has, I don't know, 70, 80 of them. Uh, we're supposed to write down the titles, the authors, and send them off to UC Santa Barbara just in case we have something they haven't heard. What are much more valuable are the ones where people's individual voices were recorded onto home recording wax cylinders. Even if it's just a letter to grandma, you know, saying happy birthday. They're trying to get every one of those they can. Uh, so there's a big search for privately recorded Edison records. Um, our own uh, UC Berkeley is doing laser scanning of the uh, wax cylinders to extract the data without actually having to run a needle over them. Uh, so there's a project going on there as well. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, well, I can think of a couple things. Um, certainly, he, he worked with, with electronic punches of paper. So the, uh, the data being sent, ones and zeros on ticker tape and being extracted into, into uh, letters being converted to pulses being converted back to letters, I think would certainly qualify for digital. He also did some very interesting things with 
his quadruplex uh, telegraph, a single wire, or consider you know, a wire in ground. Uh, initially, you could send telegraphs one message going one way, tick, 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 and then the person would send the reply back. He figured out a way to send two, one in each direction. He didn't actually patent that, but he improved on it. Uh, but then he came up with a way to send four messages at once, two in one direction, two in the other direction, and it's a combination of pulse width modulation, which we use on modems today, uh, and amplitude modulation working together. And again, it's, it's a complex thing even today to understand, and yet he got that working back then. And I think that has aspects of, of um, digital also. Yeah. I think the best you could come up with was was this analog storage of voice onto the wax cylinders. Um, but again, ticker tape information could be played back. Uh, he had a design for uh, telegraphers that would send too fast for other people to receive, and it would record that onto tape and then play it back slower so that you could actually transcribe what was sent. So to some extent, you're now recording it into short-term memory and uh, playing it back. Uh, I, I think it's a stretch to say that Edison led to the digital era. Uh, yes, sir? You demonstrated this wax cylinder machine. Uh, I understand the, the needle uh, you're <coughs> producing the sound, but how does the sound get from the needle to our ear? It's easier to see with the one back there. It has the big horn right. up top. Uh, this one has a folded horn. It has a, you can look at it. It comes off the diaphragm, goes around, and the actual horn is facing forward here. I don't want to try to take that off, but you'd see the round horn inside. And the tall machines are essentially the same, just a bigger horn up, around, and, and funneled forward. What you actually have is, is a very thin diaphragm with an a actual diamond point and that diaphragm flexes up and down, which pushes the air into the tube. Uh, it, it's really quite loud, right? If you think about that these are, are little microscopic variations, uh, and, yeah, and it's just a little megaphone, please. I mean, that's not bad. What's, what's interesting, um, I, don't, I don't really want to play with it on this one, but the, uh, the speed of these, so, so Edison is, has got, rather than, than the needle actually trying to track in the wax cylinder, which, which can damage the cylinder, he actually has gearing, and the gear moves this along at the correct rate but you can control the speed of that. There is no fixed speed. You're supposed to adjust it for what sounds good to you. So is it this the right speed? So, I mean, that was part of it, right? It was, was what do you like, what do you want to hear the sound for? So you never really were quite sure what you were listening to when you bought a recorded uh, disc. Uh, the, the speed in these is, some, is really quite an ingenious set of, of um, flywheel weights that as the motor spins, they, they go farther out with centrifugal force, and the farther out they go, they slow the motor down. Um, but just the slightest bit, if you want to repair yours, it's all about cleaning off the old oil sludge and lubricating it, and they'll, it'll run fine. We fix them all the time at the warehouse. So. Yep. Do you want to comment on the comparison of similar names of Menlo Park, New Jersey, and Menlo Park, California? 
I have no idea if the two are related. Absolutely no idea at all. I mean, there are quite a few people that would hear, um, you know, they'll hear Menlo Park Edison and they're convinced it's just down the block. It's quite possible Menlo Park was named after Menlo Park, New Jersey. I don't know if that's true. Was it the other way around? Yeah, I think it was way before Menlo, made for motion pictures. Yes, sir. Oh, it's out of Ireland. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't. There may be something there. I never, never came across it in my research. Ken? <laughs> the master of the phone. There you go. How about that? Yeah. But I, you know, I don't, I don't, I never heard of Edison coming to California uh, and taking anything back. So I think that was just it was a place there was free land. Uh, he needed land and lots of buildings. So there may have been something to him being out here, but I don't know it. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.